Well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Brian Ventura, and this is the NIST Cybersecurity Framework. And the Plus me is just a friendly name for the tool that the City of Portland built myself and my team. Um, I'm a SANS instructor. How many of you SANS familiar with SANS? All right. Uh, so I teach for them. I have a number of courses that I teach, and my next and ne next one's in Portland, which is odd for me. But it's at my hometown or where I live now, and and it's actually in town. Mostly I'm traveling. Um, the blurb about me: I've been in the industry for a long time, doing security on and off throughout that, and then lots of certifications because that's what you're supposed to do, right? As a as a professional in the IT world. I also volunteer with ISSA and OWASP locally in Portland and help put on events. And not surprisingly, I'm interested in education things since I work with SANS and I actually teach a course at the local community college and things. And then most importantly, I am a member of the Timbers Army. Any soccer fans out there? All right. Um, well, I'm a, I'm a fan of the Portland Th Timbers, which is the men's team, and then the Portland Thorns are the, the women's team. Uh, so I love going to those games. And there's my link to all the classes that I have. So I kind of have three parts for this. The first part is to talk about SANS a little bit, MSISAC, because I find it very useful, and the Center for Internet Security. Uh, then I'll talk about the framework just to get us level set on what the framework has and what it doesn't have. Uh, I won't go through the whole framework. It, it doesn't take much longer than that, but it would take me more than an hour to do that. And then I'll talk about the tool that we have, that NIST uh, Cyber CSF Plus, um, as our friendly name, how we use it. And I think the tool would be useful for any of you. I get a lot of requests because it's now published to, to use the tool, so I hope that it be, is useful for you, and I'm always interested in feedback on it. All right, so SANS is a training company. We put on two-day to six-day courses. We have lots of conferences, and we do it all over the world. Um, we're mostly focused on the United States, but we do ha have them all over the world. I was talking to somebody just recently that saw one of the videos that I did on this um, from Australia and then another person from New Zealand. So it's, it's out there. Um, SANS provides all kinds of different courses, and they, they kind of have the numbering like colleges would have. So the 400 is, is that intermediate level, and then the 500 is a little more um, difficult, and it goes all the way up to the 700 series. Uh, and there's courses. Uh, here's a quick little roadmap. I don't think it's extremely readable, but the idea is you're going to start somewhere on that left in, in the Security 401, Security Essentials, uh, maybe do uh, Incident Response 504, which was what my talk was on just previously, and then you might move into some of these other areas. So the top is more of your uh, blue team defender. That middle red is your attackers, the pen testers. The grayish, I think it's showing up there, is your incident responders, and then the green is a management course, so for, for people that are looking to be in management but manage a cybersecurity team. Um, I actually had my uh, deputy CTO, chief technology officer, go to one of the management courses so that he could understand what our team is doing. And there's development courses, the yellow that's over there, or orange. Uh, so there's a lot of different different tools that we have. We, we also have end user awareness modules that you can download and present to your um, your end users. Okay, that's enough of the sales. Um, for the city of Portland, we recognized that uh, we needed to have a framework and we we needed to have tools and resources and a logical place to go is NIST. I'm paying for it with my taxes. Most of us here, if not all of us here, are paying for it with our taxes, and it's free to us. It's, uh, so we recognized that we wanted to use NIST because it would match up with some of the compliance regimes that we have inside of local government. So um, that was for that worked for us. We also we use the critical security controls. Anybody a critical security controls person? It's one of the courses I teach. Uh, and that one was really good for us, and it was um, kind of a bottom-up technical level. Here's some technical things you can do in your network to increase your resilience and block more attackers. And so we were, we were operating there because we, we had low maturity, and this is years ago, uh, but we were doing the critical security controls. Then our new CISO came in a few years ago, and he brought asked us if we wanted to do the cybersecurity framework. And we liked the cybersecurity framework. Uh, that would be our top-down approach. 
and we merged the two, and we, we actually use both of them actively. Uh, the cybersecurity framework is our overarching framework, our top-down drives our policies, and the critical security controls, which are now called the CIS controls, are our bottom-up and our prioritization. So it tells us which controls we should do first. Yes? Priority, yes. Yeah, exactly. So, the, so, um, and I'll show that actually in the spreadsheet at the end of this. So it's, that's a great question. And then I wanted to throw up the MS ISAC. Any of us that are working for state, uh, local, tribal, and territorial organizations, we can be members of the MS ISAC, and that gives us the ability to use, leverage their resources. So that was very powerful for us. Quick blurb on the MS ISAC, the right side over there at the top, those are all free resources that they provide. They do incident response services. We've sent, for, we've sent forensics images to them and they've diagnosed those images and told us what kind of malware and what kind of attacks ha ha happened on that system. Um, but they have all kinds of resources. I highly recommend you, you look into them if you have that ability. It's a great resource. The Center for Internet Security, anybody use Center for Internet Security? Couple. Um, that one is now free through the MS ISAC if you're a, if you're a member. So, so that's pretty awesome. We, we were paying for it and now we don't have to pay for it. Then CIS provides the benchmarks. Yes? I have a question. Um, what's the comparison between that and the CalSys? I'm not familiar with So the question was what's the difference between MS ISAC and CalSys? CalSys. Uh, CISC. It was created by the governor a few years ago. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's probably a local, yeah, so that's going to be a local solution that's going to do more than just information sharing. It's going to be partnerships between private and public sector probably. Um, and, and it's going to be similar. It's going to be semi-competing, but, but those are local solutions. Oregon just passed something last year similar, and we're just getting it off the ground, so I don't know what it will look like in the end. Um, but great question. Uh, so then there's some paid services down there. So I, if, if you can get into MS ISAC, I think it's really useful. That's all I wanted to get, at, get there. So let's jump into the cybersecurity framework just to give a feel of what the, what's being offered from NIST. Uh, anybody know the history of why the cybersecurity framework was created? Why? But who, who said we should do something about this? Yeah, Obama um, originally said, hey, we should do something. We should come up with a framework. And uh, Trump has now signed it into extending it and continuing it. So it's, it's an active project, and it seems bipartisan, which is awesome. Yeah, and it's a public-private partnership. Um, when, when Obama signed that, NIST said, great, we have something. We've got NIST 853. We're good. We don't have to do anything more. And the administration said, no, 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 we need something new and something uh, better, easier to consume and focused on cr critical infrastructure. So a bunch of uh, organizations came together, including NIST and including um, ISO 27000 series. People heard of that. The, some people from there came in. The, the critical security controls came in. They all came together and talked about what the solution should be. And the bottom line was, let's not build a brand new um, framework. We already have all these other ones. So they built this framework based on all the others, and that was a really cool uh, solution, and it's a slimmed down version of 853. It's much more consumable, and it references 853. So it kind of met all the, the check boxes and, and became a really powerful solution, and people are using it all over the place outside of crit critical infrastructure. I have critical infrastructure. That's not why I'm using the cybersecurity framework. So I thought it was really powerful. The basics of the framework, they give you these five areas. So we've got identify, protect, detect, uh, respond, and recover. And the, all of our controls probably fit in, in these areas. Anything that we're doing in our organization, you say firewall, I say that's a protect. Maybe it's a detective control as well because it gives us the logs, it gives us some intelligence, but it fits in here. You say malware defense, I'm gonna again say protect, and but it's a little bit of detection as well because it's letting us know. You say intrusion detec detection, that's our detect. Incident response, that's our response. So, so you get how these things fit. Uh, so what, what else they give you is uh, these 
subcategories or categories and then subcategories will come. So inside of identify, we have asset management. We should know what assets we have in our organization because that's what we need to protect. We have business environment. We should know what our business environment looks like, how we're sharing information, how we're using data, et cetera. So that's what they give us. Then they give us this nice mapping. So now I'm pulling out specific um, examples of the different areas. I'm not covering the whole thing, just giving you an idea. But inside of Identify, we talked about that asset management. The subcategories in asset management are six specific controls that we should be doing. I don't know how easy it is to read up there, but the first one is we should have an inventory of all of our physical devices. Everybody have an inventory? Well, when I got to this control, I was working with it in the critical security controls, and I went to my teams and said, hey, do you have an inventory of all your systems? And I went to the desktop team, and they said, oh, yeah, we've got a great tool. It inventories all our systems. It keeps track of all of them. It patches. It's awesome. And I'm like, great. So you've got all the laptops in there. I'm like, oh, yeah. And all the desktops? Oh, yeah. And you have all the servers? Oh, no. <laughs> like, what? You don't have the servers? OK. Who has the servers? Well, it's not our job. We're desktop. We do, we do desktops. OK, OK, OK. So I go to the server team. Hey, do you have a tool? Oh, yeah, we've got a great tool. It inventories all our servers. I said, OK, great. So it does all the servers? Oh, yeah. And it does all the desktops? Oh, no, because that's not our job. So I realized that I've got a number of inventories. So I've got a server inventory. I've got a desktop inventory or workstation inventory. I've got a network inventory when I went to my network team. Um, who takes care of printers? Oh, that's the desktop team. Hey, desktop team, do you have printers in there? No, we don't keep track of those. We don't keep track of those. Oh, great. Are they on my network? Yes. Can they be attacked? Yes. OK, I need an inventory of those. What about IoT devices? Do we have cameras and, and all of those things? Yes, we have all of those. Who keeps track of those? No one keeps track of those. Or if they do, they keep track of them in a weird way, like the camera deployment team keeps track of the ones that they've sold to people, you know, but they don't keep track of all of them. That doesn't make sense. So I had to work on this and build our, our inventory. And now we have a CMDB, a configuration management database. And all of these different feeds for desktop and server feed up into our CMDB so that we have a more comprehensive look. We also use our scanning system to augment that. So everybody says they have their inventory. We scan everything. And we say, well, what about that device? And they say, oh didn't get that one, the agent didn't work, whatever the problem is, but, but we, we augment. But those are the types of controls that we have to think about inside of um, this specific control. On the far right there, you see that we have uh, some references. These references are how they made the cybersecurity framework small by saying, we're not going to give you a ton of detail about each of these controls. We're going to tell you, if you want the detail, go look at these other documents. And the first one is the critical security controls, control one. And then the bottom one is the other one I want to call out, and there, that's the NIST 853. NIST 853 is where you're going to get most of the detail uh, if you use 853 or if you don't use anything else. Otherwise, you may use some of these other ones. The ISA ones are critical infrastructure things. COBIT is an audit framework, if anyone's familiar with that. Um, and then ISO 27000 series is your um, international standard. Um, th there is a cost for ISO, so I would recommend if you're looking for one to use the cybersecurity framework with 853 as your augmentation. Yeah. Exactly, yes. Yeah. So you're using the CSF as your framework and you're just looking at these other uh, documents for more detail. Exactly. So you can see that there's a number of controls. We're going to need to identify our software um, that we have on our systems, how we're doing our communication. That third one, I think, is, is scary for most people. So we, our organization's communication and data flows are mapped. That one's hard, I think. Uh, maybe you guys have handled this. If you have, then you can... Uh, laugh at me and then tell me how you did it because I want to know. Um, but, but this is an area that we want our business units to tell us how they're using data, how they're um, communicating with others so that we can put protections around those streams. If you remember back a long time ago, uh, Target was breached. How did they get breached? 
through their HVAC vendor. So this vendor flow that wasn't documented well enough, apparently, I'm, I'm saying that, I don't know if that's true, uh, but the vendor flow allowed, it, allowed someone to come in from the outside through this vendor portal and then jump, the jump over to the credit card systems and start stealing credit cards, right? And that, that was what the breach was. So that flow, if they would have documented it, they may have noticed that vendors never need to get to credit card data, so let's put a barrier there. Um, and that's where this, this kind of a control could be useful. Um, so a number of controls there. Another example just from the identify is the risk management strategy. Uh, for the city of Portland, this is really important because we want to align our controls with actual risk because vendors will come, sorry, uh, vendors will commonly tell us, oh, you should buy whatever we have. It's the best thing in the world. It will solve all your problems. And that may not be true for us. We may have gaps in different areas. So identifying what our risks are, where our sensitive data is, where our controls are weakest is important to be able to make informed decisions and, and spend our money um, appropriately. So. Yeah, what are we protecting? Exactly, yeah. All right, so then we move into Protect, and Protect has some different controls. So um, I'm just pulling out the identity management here. We should know what our user accounts are, who has access to data, and how do we protect those. So do we have passwords, and do we st store passwords in the clear? Hopefully not. Hopefully we encrypt them. Hopefully we use strong encryption. Hopefully we use salts and things like that. All of those fall into some of these um, specific controls here. In addition, what access does people ha do people have? I'm in information security. Should I have access to our revenue department's um, information, or should I have access to the police department's information, or um, our parks department information? I probably shouldn't have access to that because I don't do those jobs. So that that's what's in encompassed inside of these controls. If I don't know what I'm what where they're going to fall out and how to manage those. I have all those references, Critical Security Control 16, NISP um, 853, going to give us lots of information about this. So very useful. Our detection, same kind of things. Now we're shifting from blocking to noticing when th bad things happen. We want to check those anomalies and make sure that we understand what's going on. So this could be our intrusion detection systems. If you have intrusion prevention systems, they're technically in that protect arena. However, they may have detection rules turned on because you can do that in an, uh, an IPS and an IDS are the same system with de deployed in a different place uh, with different rules turned on. So you could have them run running both detection and protection and they would fit in these controls. Um, again, we're gonna look at those NIST documents to find out exactly what we should do. And we're gonna do some of our continuous monitoring on our network. So those are the types of controls we have here. Um, our response, we've got obviously incident response. That's gonna be a big part of this. Uh, making sure that we understand uh, what we're going to do when something adverse happens. Uh, who are we going to communicate to? How are we going to do that communication? What are our legal requirements? How are we going to respond? Who's going to, what are we going to do during that response? Are we taking forensics images or are we just bringing ourselves back to production because we, we don't have that maturity? All of that is built into this respond area. And we can dig in deeper to each one of those to understand the gaps that we have in our organizations. And then our last one is recover. And the obvious one for most technology people is do we do system backups, right? Um, my argument when I talk to our different teams, I don't care if they do backups. I care if they can restore the data in a responsible amount of time with, with very little loss. I don't care how they do their backups. Most commonly, when I go to those teams and I say, um, do you have the ability to recover your, our data? They say, oh yes, we're doing backups. And I say, okay, great, well, when does the last time you tested it? And they say, oh, just yesterday there was a help desk ticket and we had to restore one email. I said, okay, great. And the day before that, we had to store three files. I said, okay, great, that's awesome. When have you restored a whole server? And they say, oh, we don't do that. Or now they do, we actually have um, practices of this. That's what I want them to do is recover a whole server because that's where you might find your problems and not have uh, the data. 
as an aside, as a story to give you an idea about this, the city of Portland got hit by ransomware a lot in 2015 and 2016. That's passe for us now, so we've moved on to phishing and we're getting hit ridiculously by phishing. But back when we were doing our ransomware, uh, our recovery was to find the machines, uh, uh, re restore, or sorry, rebuild the machine from a gold image, and then restore the file systems that got hit with that ransomware. And by the way, it would always happen when I was doing something like this and I was out of the city, they would get hit, and I would come back to the aftermath of it, and, and everybody would say, you can't leave anymore because every time you leave, this happens. Uh, well, one of the times that I was gone and I was telling this story, um, we got hit with a ransomware, and the ransomware in, uh, encrypted a two terabyte file system. And we, by, at this point, we were awesome at responding and, and recovering from ransomware. We've done it 15 times and we're good. I come back and they say, we're still working on it a week later. I'm like, what are you talking about? We, we, we do this. They say, I don't know, we ran into a bug. Um, when restoring over one terabyte, um, our system would crater, our backup solution would crater and there was no solution. We had to call the vendor. The vendor said it's a bug. They had to do issue. They had to figure out the bug. They had to write a patch. They had to give us a patch. It took us two weeks to recover from this one. That's why I want the full test of a server because I want to find those problems. Yeah, you can restore three files, a hundred files, a gigabyte of files, but can you do it when it's critical when we need it for the whole system? So that's a big deal for me, um, and that's what's inside of these recover. The other part that's inside of this recover that starts to pull outside of cybersecurity, but it's still related, is that disaster recovery. What's the disaster down here? Earthquakes are one. Are there others? Fires. Okay, that's another one. Yeah, we just had a weird one, in, a re weird fire in Portland. It wasn't a forest fire. It was like a scrapyard thing. Anyways, um, so in those events. You, you should have a plan to recover from a fire, from a disastrous fire or an earthquake. Um, Portland, by the way, ours is, is earthquake. We're supposed to get a 9.0 without any notice and we don't have earthquakes in Portland. So um, we, 60% of our buildings or something will fall over, stuff like that. We're, we're in bad shape. So that disaster recovery and business continuity is part of these controls, and it might not be cybersecurity, so I may point to other teams that are doing disaster recovery, that are doing business continuity. But these are the controls. So hopefully that gives you a flavor for the basics of the NIST cybersecurity framework, there's a lot more in there. Um, as you work with it, I think you'll, you'll tease out those pieces, but I'm always available to talk about those things um, offline. Now I wanted to get into how the city uses it and how we have our CSF Plus. So for the city, we wanted to make sure that we were uh, providing value to our bureaus. You may call them departments, whatever, uh, but there are different business lines. And for uh, most of you understand this, but when I give this talk in the private sector, um, I have to explain that we have like 39 business lines that are completely different. You know, parks and police, they don't interact together very much, where most businesses have two or three product lines that are very similar. So, I, so we want to be able to provide value to all those separate uh, bureaus, and we want to make sure that we manage their risks and reduce their risks. So we wanted a solution that would give us a priority of our, of our risks and uh, address the risks by their priority. We wanted to identify what our maturity is. We were using the critical security controls so we understood certain things that we were doing and we knew there were ga gaps in other areas, but we want to display that and track it over time. We wanted to um, use the critical security controls because that was a big deal for us, that's that CSC. And we wanted to track our budgets and our resource allocations because I don't know about you guys, but I don't have all the money in the world to be able to buy all these cool solutions and have a, a team of 100. I have a team of, um, I'm, I'm an architect, so my boss is the CISO and there's three architects under him and we have an intern. So there's five of us total, uh, but we don't do operations. We, we gave away that stuff because we don't have enough people for it. So we wanted to manage those things. 
So what we came up with is something like this, and this is the first page of the document. You can download it, it's a great tool. This is just informational, and I'm gonna talk about this stuff, but I just to give you a feel, that's what it looks like. Um, starting, oh, that was supposed to say, okay, that, there, sorry. Uh, that, th these are the things that we wanted to accomplish. So we wanted to, uh, to add in our actual service catalog. What services does information security or technology services at the city of Portland provide? Because we don't do everything, uh, but we wanted to be able to align what we do to the CSF controls. We wanted to do risk management. We wanted to make sure we were using the critical security controls. We wanted to manage our budget, both the current budget, what, was, what we asked for and we didn't receive, a uh, three-year plan. We actually mapped this to a five-year plan uh, now. We wanted to track our maturity, and we wanted to have our project roadmap so people could see what projects we were doing when and how our resources might be conflicting um, doing different projects. And the, the cybersecurity framework doesn't do this by default, but it's easy to adapt it and put it in, and that's what we did here. And, it's, and again, our tool is an Excel spreadsheet. It's not rocket science, but it is pretty awesome and hopefully pretty useful for others. This is what it looks like. You don't have to read that. I just wanted to go th show you what it looks like, and then I'm going to go through the different uh, pieces of it. Uh, the deck is going to be shared, I think, to all people that are participants here, and uh, th this document is on GitHub, so uh, the link for GitHub is at the end. But this is what it looks like, and moving forward in it, so let me just start focusing on different fields. The first three columns to our left here are the NIST Cybersecurity Framework. That's it. We just got the NIST Cyber Cybersecurity Framework. But that fourth column on the right is our service catalog. And here, if you can read it, it says things like um, NAC and SSO and IAM. That's just general terminology. What we really have in our document uh, is the tools that we use or the processes that we follow. So in, what, what I su suggest for each of you is to take this document and replace those terms with the actual solutions you have and then identify the things that you might not have. Maybe you don't have an IAM solution because those are really expensive and complex to Im implement, but now you know that there's a need for one and you can start planning that project, planning that budget, whatever you're doing there. So this is our service catalog uh, or an example of one. The next couple of uh, columns are risk columns. So the first column is a just a raw risk that we built on our own for our, for our organization. And it's just risk ranking one through 25 or however many lines there are. If you can actually read them, there's like four A's and B's because of um, a previous where this data came from. But the idea here is that the lower the number, the more important for us to manage that risk. And we came up with it by sitting in a room with people that knew what they were doing. You know, we'll all sit here and we'll say, well, what do you think our, our biggest risks are? And we'll say, oh, we don't have a good inventory of our systems, or we don't have firewalls, or we don't have intrusion detection. We'll talk about that and then we'll prioritize those. Um, we didn't for us on this because we had a good handle on it, but we do risk assessments with the business line, so that's feeding some of this information. So not when we did the project, but it, that could work for you or, or for your organization. Bring the business units in and have them talk about their risks because if you don't, haven't had that conversation, you don't know what your risks are. So that's very powerful. Uh, the, uh, the second column is the critical security controls. We, there's a mapping, master mapping document uh, out in the world that has the critical security controls and then every compliance that's ever been created in the world. There's like 30 or 50 line columns so far. And uh, so we were able to map back from the critical security controls to the cybersecurity framework and we use that as our prioritization. So critical security control one and two are have an inventory of all your physical assets and have all your inv an inventory of all your software, and that is in that identity management um, section or that identify section, and that's why we have them listed out that way. Next, we wanna track budget. This is a three year, We may, as I said, we made ours a five year. This is where we're gonna put real numbers in. We're gonna say we requested 500,000 for that project, 10,000 for that project, 30,000 for the other project. Maybe we're, we're requesting a little bit of money this year to kick off the project, a large bulk next year to, perform, to buy the big tool, and then maintenance years after that um, ongoing. 
but we, we reflect them here by putting the actual numbers in, and we have color coding. Black means that we requested the information, uh, or sorry, requested the money, and it isn't budget cycle yet, so we don't know if we've received it or not. The green means we requested it and we received that money. We now are allowed to spend it. And then red reflects that we requested that, in, that money and we did not get the money for this year. Uh, budget cycle was, was you know, uh, prioritized differently and we didn't get our money. The reason why we want to record that is black items, of course, help everybody to understand where we're, gonna, we're potentially spending money. Green items tell us what projects we will be running and what projects we have to put on the back burner because we didn't get the funding. And then those red items show our track record of what we attempted to do but couldn't do because we didn't have the budget. So maybe three years later, you've asked for the same thing three years in a row. Maybe they'll give it to you that fourth year because you can show this trend of, we have been asking for identity management. I know it's expensive, but it is the most important thing left in our perfect information security. Okay, we're not perfect. <laughs> but, but you know, you get what I mean that you can ask for uh, money based on the trend of you not getting it, and maybe that would get you that, inf that money. Our next section I wanted to show was this uh, maturity model. We actually use the CMMI model, which is a five-level um, system. This one shows uh, seven levels, I guess, zero through six. Uh, this is older information, but we put the CMMI model, that's what's in the, the downloadable version of this, and the concepts here are they're Everything, if you, if you filled it all the way out to the right, you would be the highest level of maturity optimizing in the CMMI model. You'd be doing the, all the good things that you possibly could do with that control. The light gray is our goal. We don't want to be as mature as possible because we recognize that's too expensive for the city of Portland. If we were the NSA or some other organization, sure, we would spend that money and have that maturity level. But at the city of Portland, most of my data is public uh, and I don't have all the money to spend on this. So I'm gonna say we wanna be the middle of the road. Now, the reality is it won't be a straight line for you. You're, each of these controls, you'll give a different maturity goal potentially and you can decide for your organization. So this would be a, a different graph than what's shown there. The dark gray is what we've accomplished. So we have that maturity level. As you can see in this document, it suggests we're very immature in this document. This is demo data. Um, but it shows where management that we need to work on these things. We are not doing what we need to do. We're gonna be the next person in the paper, or next organization in the paper with, uh, with a breach if we don't work on these things. The yellow color is the concept that we are failing at this. This is a, a challenge area for us. We're losing maturity or it's a focus area that we haven't been able to focus on. We know that, for instance, fishing is a huge problem for us right now. It wasn't a problem three years ago for us. So we haven't focused on building those solutions. A yellow could show management that this is a new emerging type of a problem that we're having trouble with. If we've orphaned a product project or a, or a tool, that would be where it's becoming yellow. We're not maintaining it over time. The green is something we've recently accomplished. We're making progress in that, highlighting that. There's a yellow green. I have no idea how you can get a yellow green. People ask me and I don't even know why it's in there. So I apologize for that. I don't know how you could be losing some maturity but gaining other maturity in the same control. So that's just an anomaly here. You, you guys can fix that in your organizations. Um, our last section here is our uh, projects over a three to five year cycle and it's by quarter to give us an idea of the things that we're doing. So if we said that we were gonna do an identity management project, maybe there would be a um, proof of concept or a, a evaluation of the software, an implementation of the software, a, a optimizing maturity, maturing of the process. Uh, we put in here, we do risk assessments I mentioned, so we put in risk assessments for different quarters so that we can spread them out and get them all done within the year, but not have them all happen at the end of the year just before uh, we have to do our PCI compliance or something like that. So we can line them out there. We can also start seeing trends like 
Uh, this column that I'm not gonna be able to give you very well, but this column seems to have a lot going on in one quarter. We should probably split that out. There's no way we can do all that. There's only um, five of us in our team. We can't accomplish that. This document allows us to see that and, and adjust the projects for that. So we put a recurring things on here. We put our big rollouts on here and we put our audits on there to give us an idea of where we're doing work, when we're doing work. Any questions so far? Yes. So with NIST, um, which we're also moving forward with, with ISO, there's all kinds of certification bodies and review mm -hmm. bodies and things like that. But with NIST, have you found anyone to come in here and say, you know, we're looking Yeah, along. we're going to give you a thumbs up. You yeah. have an AOC or what? Or sorry. Uh, paper on the wall for 27,001. Yeah. Uh -huh. There's not a piece of paper on the wall that I'm aware of for no. Yeah, there isn't. Um, no, no, we do. So for our compliance, we have to meet whatever that compliance is. So for instance, PCI wants to have that proof that you did the good thing. We're level one um, at the city of Portland. So we're up there with Target because we do that many transactions because of people paying for uh, parking on the street. That's how we, we get that many transactions. But that means we have a Q, um, QSA come in and do an audit internally every year and that's where we get our document from them that says we're doing a good job but we use the cybersecurity framework to meet that compliance um, and then we have other compliance that we have to meet of course. So were you tempted to go ISO 27001 so you can put a piece of paper on the wall? No. Um, we were too immature. We were t a bunch of geeks doing technical stuff and doing really good. We had awesome firewall management or whatever, but we didn't have that high level fire uh, framework and, and policy. And that's where the new CISO in the last three years has come in and given us that. And that's where this is coming from. Um, but also we don't want to pay for ISO and we don't need that certification today. So we, we do a lot of internal audit and things like that so that we can prove to different organizations, but we don't have any organizations that need us to provide a, a, like a SOC 2 or anything like that. So, other questions? All right. Um, so, th I went through our projects. So, this is kind of an idea of, of what it looks like, just to, to remind you that it's a longer document. Another thing that we found in these controls is that some of the controls are governance controls. And for us, that was very important because governance controls means I do it. So risk assessments and identification of, of data flows, I can, I can help in those areas where the operational things like running the, the intrusion detection system or something like that, that's operational, not my job. Someone else is doing that. So we, I can identify who owns these types of controls and put their names in it potentially. We actually, in our version of the document, there's two versions of this document. In, our, in the new version of the document, we actually have a column for who owns it so that we can go to those teams and show them their controls. In addition, because it's Excel, it's very versatile, we can hide some of the columns. Some of these middle columns that I have in this little box, uh, they not everybody needs to see that. Not everybody needs to see how much money we're spending. Not everybody needs to see exactly what our maturity is, but maybe they wanna see that service catalog or they wanna see that we're meeting some of these controls. We can hide these columns. It's Excel, hide the columns, and then they, they don't see it. In addition, we can take specific controls and go to the teams that work on those controls and you and show them just their control and say what do you need for a budget what resources do you need what projects are in your pipeline how are you maturing um, your offering for this service that you're providing for us so we, 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 we can cut down to just those there's the, the, another part of the document that's, that's kind of our first page that I talked about with the bubbles. It's a really awesome document uh, to play with and, and show your maturity. And that's all I have for now. But we can talk about this. We can talk about anything else that you want to talk about. Yes? I was just wondering if there is a link between uh, what we have here, the requirement, to a requirement to select the vendors that would probably satisfy the requirement. So you're saying, you're saying, is there a link between our requirements and what we require of a third party that we're doing something with? So let's say we have a cloud service or something like that. Um, that is where probably 
Uh, we would put it in our service catalog that we use those services. So we're Office 365. And so inside of my identity management, I may have um, Microsoft listed because we have ADFS and things like that that we're using as, as tools. Or if we have their DLP or their um, compliance management, their tools will be put in there. As far as what we need them to provide to us, uh, we don't really track that in this document, though I could see it being um, something that you do track in there. That's interesting. I like that. Yeah? Oh, just to uh, tie on to that, so there are cloud service providers that fall under what, what the government calls FedRAMP. Yeah. Uh, so under FedRAMP, these systems have been vetted against the NIST framework and they're granted authorizations to operate based on meeting either moderate or high level Roles. Yeah. So in the county of Santa Barbara, we're looking exclusively at GovCloud and all the FedRAM service providers as well as CGIS. Yes. So that's a very good benchmark for trusted cloud providers is that FedRAM certification. Yeah. So I'm going to repeat that just for the recording. Uh, you, you're just commenting on this that uh, when dealing with the cloud, because we're government agencies, most of us here at least, we should be looking for FedRAMP. That is a certification that the cloud provider gets to uh, prove that they've met the NIST requirements. And uh, a lot of these you can get the GovCloud version of things. So for instance, Office 365, the public goes with E1, E2, E6, whatever version that they're using, and we're using G1, G2, G6, whichever version we're using. Um, and that just means that it's in one of those gov clouds. It meets FedRAMP standards. It also re meets an extra standard of all data is kept within the continental US because that's another one of our requirements because we're government. Uh, and that allows us to put CGIS data in there potentially if that's what we wanted to do with it or um, some of the other compliance regimes that are government specific. So that is a really good point. Any other questions? Yeah. I was hoping you could speak to the uh, MS ISAC um, solution provider and how the Albert solution fits in, whether if a government entity, which I work for a government entity, if we have our own SOC and our own IPS and all the other wraparound services for edge protectors, whether it be Palos, is that type of service worth looking into since it's sort of free for the consult and the yeah. evaluation process? So the question is, uh, with the MSI SAC, if you have a robust security department already, you're, you're doing a lot of good things, is there value in choosing some of the additional MSI SAC solutions? For instance, they have a product called Albert, which is uh, actually a Symantec product underneath, but they bring in a sensor and they put it in your organization and it does some identification based on threat feeds that it receives and sees if it can find problems happening in your network and MSISAC manages that for you so you don't have to uh, cultivate those threat feeds and things like that. So I think there's value. We're not using it ourselves so I can't give you real world experience with it, but I, I believe that it's a really powerful tool. We haven't gone after it yet because we have other things that we're focusing on and working on, but that is on our radar of something that we may want to do. So, yeah. Good question. There's one back. Yeah, I was curious, like in the response component, we've seen that uh, there's a lot of what they call controls there, but they really perceive, that we perceive them as more kind of procedural nuances to an overarching control. So we've done a, lot, a fair amount of consolidation of those controls. So I was wondering if, if you've done any consolidation or if you have <coughs> uh, used, you know, not done any uh, consolidation and left the controls as is. So you're saying in the respond area that uh, the controls seem much more high level procedural things and not really nitty gritty how you're going to do your incident response? More like, a, so you know, the control should kind of give the high level expectation of man mm -hmm. management's, you know, expectations of how things should happen. And it seems like a lot of them are more procedural, like thou shalt do, you know, check zones on a weekly basis or something like that. So it seemed like uh, they were facets that would satisfy control as opposed to being a control that should sit amongst by itself. I see. So yeah. we've consolidated them. Yeah, so how we dealt with our incident response, and I, I, I hear you that the 
the controls that are in the cybersecurity framework are much more procedural and not real strong controls. There, there's another NIST document, I'm forgetting the number, it might be 161 is the incident response. I may be totally wrong and it's something else, but um, the, in the 800 series, there's an incident response one. We recognize that was a gap for us at the city. And so a, couple, a few years ago, we built an incident response plan and we used other NIST documents to build the plan and then we just made sure it met, met these. So our incident response plan is much more robust than these few controls that are in here, yeah. So now one of the things that I've recognized as a minor weakness in the cybersecurity framework is that it is focused on uh, critical infrastructure. So for instance, there's no control for managing your wireless network. Why not? I think their answer would likely be if you were asking the people that built this, the, the, the actual framework, they would say, don't do wireless in, in industrial control systems, right? So that might be their response to it, and that's why there's not a control in here, because you're not even supposed to do it. Uh, but for people like us that are dealing with it in a corporate environment or a, or a government environment that's not just SCADA, we would say uh, we need that wireless control. And so I just put it in my network section. I put the wireless control for us personally. So yeah, there are some some things that could be fixed in here for use in the wider populace outside of critical infrastructure. Yes? No, just to expand on that, because I used to do certification and accreditation for the feds a while back. Um, the way that this is structured, the 853 Rev 4, mm -hmm. uh, the entire list of controls were designed to be applied to specific systems. Mm -hmm. So you would define your system for FIPS 199 and say, okay, here's my uh, Active Directory system, or here's my uh, SCADA system. And then you would select those controls which include these, but as well as technical controls which get into more minutiae, they get into media access, they get into mm -hmm. um, authorizations, uh, that sort of thing. So when you're looking at <coughs> applying those specific technical controls, use it in the context of a system and not the entire enterprise. Although there may be instances where a general support system like Active Directory will be uh, will give controls that are inherited by other applications for a single sign-on. Mm -hmm. So it was designed for the federal government in a, in a greater context, and yeah. this is sort of custom tailored to the exactly. general procedures and the governance associated with critical infrastructure. Yeah. So the comment, just to repeat for the recording again, uh, is that NIST 853 is, is designed as an all-encompassing all the controls possible in the world, hopefully, that's their, that's their goal. And the realization is that you're not gonna apply all of 853 everywhere because it's too many controls. There's a control for what you do when you're in a bombing site, you know, and I don't wanna know about that because I don't wanna ever be there, thank you very much. Um, so this view, the cybersecurity framework, is really a tailored view of 853 specifically focused on critical infrastructure Critical infrastructure is vague enough that it's that it's wide, and that's why we're using it in our city of Portland uh, infrastructure, even though we're not critical infrastructure only. We do have critical infrastructure, but it's not our primary network. So uh, yes, this is a tailored view to it. There's another document that came out in 2016, which is NIST 800-171, and that is their document for organizations that deal with federal data they have to comply with that one. And so it's another tailored view that might be a good use case as well as this document. And I could see myself someday switching, but, but when we started with the cybersecurity framework, the 171 didn't exist. Other questions? Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. I, I, so he was asking the question, no, where's the links? You said there were going to be some links. Come on, man. All right, here's my links. Right in the middle is the one that you're looking for, the CSF planning spreadsheet. Uh, it's on GitHub. And there are two versions of this. There's 2016 and there's 2017. Uh, the 2017 version, one of our Excel experts in our team took this and did all kinds of Excel wizardry to make it much easier to understand and to build out your maturity by asking questions, et cetera. So he just added a bunch to it. It's still the same content. I put them both up there because I think there's value in either one of them. 
I have the link to the MSI SAC Center for Internet Security. I think they're great resources. And for the us government people, it's a free resource. The NIST cybersecurity framework is just the generic place for that. The critical security controls, which are now the CIS controls, that's the link for that. And at the bottom is my link to my courses. So um, you're always welcome, of course, to come to my courses. I'd love to hear you. And, and I move around more, by the way, when I'm teaching. I'm, I'm sitting because they're filming, and, I, and I'm a walker. So I'd be over there, and they'd say, I can't hear you. So that's why I'm sitting today. Other questions? Conversation? All right. Well, thank you for your time. And I'm available. Thanks. I'm available at the, the SANS booth uh, for the rest of the day, so come talk to me. And we can talk